Come on, it's so great to be in God's house today. I wanna just welcome you. If you are new with us, we're so honored that you would be here today. My name is Tim, and I have the honor and privilege of leading this amazing community of people. And if you are here for the first time, you're catching us toward the tail end of kind of our inaugural series for 2024. And the idea of me in three, has this been helpful for anybody as we begin the year? Come on, has it? I, I, for me, it's really challenged me to think differently this year. That's the whole point, because so often we get into a new year, and most of us are all revved up and ready to go, and how we're gonna change everything this month, and we're gonna lose this weight, and we're gonna get our finances in order. We've got all these grand ideas, and then we tend to, let's be honest, flame out by the time we get to February, and we don't accomplish any of them. And so we decided to take a different approach this year and, and not just think in the short term, but try to go a little bit longer than that. In fact, the idea behind me and three is really this powerful thought. I've said it every week because I want you to get this in your mind, and that is that we tend to overestimate what we can do in the short term, and we underestimate what we can do in the long term. That, that if we were to just like take our lives and not just think I've gotta do it all today, but, but what habits can we create can we start doing that maybe over the next three years would lead us to the life that we really hope to have, would lead us to the life that we feel like God's calling us to live. And to kick off this series, in week one, we looked at a psalm, Psalm chapter 90, and I kind of said, look, Psalm 90 verse 12 has been a little bit of a theme for this entire series. And I've challenged our church to, hey, why don't you memorize Psalm 90, verse 12. How many of you have it memorized? How many of you got it memorized? Okay, this is, we're gonna see. It's just gonna be you and me. Nobody else did. Oh, you got it. Of course, hey, uh, gold star for Pastor Russ. He has it memorized, so I really appreciate that. It's Psalm 90, verse 12. I think more of you have it. I've said it every week. So let's try it. If you know it, I'm not gonna put the words up yet. You gotta say it out loud with me. This is gonna be a mess in a train wreck. Psalm 90, verse 12, it's a small verse, a great new habit, memorize scripture this year, okay? Psalm 90, verse 12 says this, teach us to our days that we may gain a, okay, that was uh, pretty awful, but let's go ahead and put the words up. Let's see if we can get this passage into our spirit today. Psalm 90, verse 12 says, let's say it out loud together. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. What, what does that mean? It means help us to count every moment so that we can make every moment count. It means let's pay attention to the value of time that we've been given and let's not waste it but let's do something important with the life that God has given us. And that's what we've been talking about throughout this series, Me and Three. In week one, you remember, we, I, I tried to inspire us to dream a little bit, to kind of think, what could you accomplish, not, not this year, but maybe over three years? And maybe for some of you, you're feeling challenged, like I've wanted to go back to school, maybe it's to get your master's degree. Do you know if you started now, you could probably finish that in three years? Maybe it's to learn a new language because there's an area that you've always wanted to go visit and you're just, you've always wanted to expand your horizon. And I don't know what it is. Maybe it's to start a business. I, I don't know what it might be, but I just wanted to inspire you to say, listen, don't waste the time that we have. We've got, the next three years can be the most profound years of your life if you put some direction and focus. And in week two, we talked about, let's not just plan the next three years without asking, what is God's calling on my life? Let's not just think about all the career goals and family goals and vacation goals and retirement goals, but let's also think about what did God create me to do? What's my purpose, my calling? How do I move toward that? And in week three, last week, we talked about the ideas that we don't naturally move toward our purpose. We move toward, does anybody remember? We move toward our patterns. We talked about our patterns and what are, we, what are we gonna do to create new patterns? We have new practices that create new patterns in our life and that's how we get to the purpose and the life that God created us to live. Now, we gave out a little homework last week. I don't know if you brought it back with you. You've gotta bring your homework back to school with you. But I challenged everybody, we gave everybody an envelope with a letter. Did you do your letter? Did any of you do your letter? Okay, I love it, George, appreciate that. Appreciate somebody did it. I filled out my letter. 
okay? What, what we, we challenge everybody to do is to write a letter to themselves in three years. To, to say, hey, these are the things that I really believe that I wanna move toward over the next three years. And we have an opportunity, if you haven't seen it, you can drop your letter off. Now listen, if you weren't here, you missed it. You can pick up a letter in an envelope from Next Steps at the end of the experience. We have a way online, so if you're online, we're dropping a link right there in the chat so you can fill one out. And it's just a way for you to say, you know, over the next three years, this is what I hope and dream. And guess what, at the end of the three year period of time, in 2027, we're gonna mail these back to you. So you put your address on it, you drop it off, and, and we're gonna help keep ourselves accountable. And so if you haven't done this, can I challenge you and encourage you to do it? Because there's something about the process of it that makes you really think about the next three years of your life. There's something powerful about doing that. Now as we kind of bring this series to a close, I was thinking to myself, now that we feel inspired to tackle the world, now that we feel inspired to, to do new things, to create new practices, to move in a new direction, I thought to myself, I wonder how many of us are gonna feel so incredibly challenged when we start writing down and thinking about all the things that we're gonna do now, and we think about all the things we're gonna add over the next three years. I'm gonna start this new hobby I've always wanted to do. I'm gonna join this, I'm gonna go to a gym, I'm gonna do all this, and I thought to myself, the reality for most of us is that we're adding maybe some new things that we've always dreamt of starting and doing but do you know what we're not adding to us over the next three years? Time. The truth is, you don't get any more time to start something new, to begin something, to move in a new direction. You don't. We all get the exact same amount of time. And I thought, the reality is, most of us, can I just say here in America, already have full schedules, don't we? I mean, let's be honest. Most of us are living with full schedules already. We're, we're, our day is packed from the beginning until the very end. Most of us fill our lives with so many things every single day that maybe the sheer thought of starting something new, beginning a new project, moving in a new direction, just sounds intimidating. It's true, because I have found that so many of us were overworked, were overscheduled, we're overwhelmed by our lives. In fact, when I, when I think about a typical day of a parent, if you're a parent, we got a lot of parents in the house. When I think about a parent, a typical day for you might look something like this. You wake up a little extra early because if you don't get ready before your kids get up, good luck. And so you have to get up early. You gotta get shower. You gotta get ready before they do. Then you have to get them up. Then you have to get them ready because they've gotta go to school. Then you've gotta pack lunch, not just for them, but maybe for you. Get their stuff together. Get out the door early. Drop them off at a bus stop or drop them off at school or drop them off at a friend's house who's gonna stick them on the bus because you got to get to work in time and then you go to work and you work all day long and then you leave work to get back at home in time to get your kids off the bus or get your kids from school or from latchkey or whatever it is and then when you get home you got to do schoolwork and homework you got to get all this stuff done you got to start making dinner and maybe you got to run them to their sports because they got practice five days a week and then when you get back from that it's really late you got to start bed process bathe them you got to read books to them you got to tuck them in and by the time you're done it's 8 30 almost nine o'clock and you lay down in your bed and you take your first breath <sighs> and you're mentally exhausted and so you and you and your spouse you put on your favorite TV show and you're gonna watch another episode of Suits <laughs> and before it's even over you fall asleep does sound like anybody's day yeah yeah like nailed it didn't I because the reality is most of us, to, to create the life that we want and all the things that we really dream about, you might be sitting there going, that sounds really great. And I, maybe I tried to write this letter out and think, well, I really wanna do this and we wanna go to these places and wanna accomplish this. But the truth is, most of us have no capacity to do it. We don't. And I was trying to think to myself, why is it that with all the advancements in technology that we've had today, I mean, we have, I mean, think about it. The, there's so many things, but we're busier than we've ever been. Why is it that we feel the need to fill our schedules from morning to night? Why is it that we have so many activities and we're always on the go and we're trying to fit so much in every single day? And you know what I think is really behind it all? 
I think the really, the, the reason why we have full schedules is because most of us are actually trying to fill our souls. That the reason why most of us have full schedules is because we really have empty souls. Because behind every full schedule, there is something inside of us that is longing and craving. We have appetites, we have things that we want out of life. And most of us are moving in every direction trying to fill that appetite, that, appetite, that void. We have cravings, we have natural things. We, we wanna be respected, so we're gonna work and put in extra time at work because I want someone to respect me. We wanna be valued. We wanna, I need to be able to bring something home for the family. I need to be able to do this. We, we wanna be known, we wanna be loved, we wanna be successful, we wanna be respected. We want, we want all of these things. We wanna be happy. We wanna be satisfied. We wanna feel fulfilled in life. We wanna feel like my life matters and counts. And so what do we do? We just run after all these things that we're filling our lives with. But the honest truth is it's not really satisfying. Let's be honest. In fact, I, I, I like to picture the process of what happens like this. An empty soul, someone with an empty soul tends to have a full schedule, but what they end up with is an exhausted life. When our soul is empty, when we don't have peace, when we when we don't know the meaning of life, when we don't have our purpose, when we don't understand our why, we fill it with what? Trying to satisfy those cravings and our schedules are packed full, thinking this will give us a happy life, but we end up with an exhausted life. And I thought to myself as we kind of finish this conversation, listen, I love to dream and I love to think about the next several years and what I want out of my life and I hope you do out of your life, but I thought to myself, if we don't pause to talk about what does it look like to make room for the life that we really hope to live, we never will, we'll just be frustrated with a list and a letter that will get mailed to us three years from now and we'll just think, man, I wish I could have done half of that. I wanna talk about today as we end this, how do you create space to create the life that you want to live? How do you do that? How do I create space? In fact, there's two passages that I wanna use if you got your Bible with you. We're gonna go to God's word because I believe it'll be impactful in this area. We're gonna start in Luke chapter 10 and then we're gonna end in Ecclesiastes 4. We're gonna look at New Testament and Old Testament. In Luke chapter 10, there is a moment that maybe some of you will be familiar with that I think expresses two different perspectives on how we approach moments, how we're thinking about our life and our time. In Luke chapter 10, verse 38, it says this, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made, and she came to him, Jesus, and he asked, she asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Now I wanna pause for just a moment before we look at Jesus' answer. I know some of you might be real familiar with this story. You've probably heard it before if you've been around church. This is a moment that is, it's, it's, it's powerful, right? You, you've got Mary and Martha, two sisters, and we don't get a whole lot of information about Mary and Martha. There's a couple other moments that they appear in the scene. We, we, we kind of get this picture right here that Martha is the busy one and Mary is the lazy one, right? That's kind of the picture we get. Martha is the, the one who's distracted, it says, by all the details. And Mary's the one who just is like, oh, I'm just sitting with Jesus, just listening to everything he has to say. And, and, I, and if you know this story, most of us would know that Martha gets kind of uh, the bad rap and Mary, she's, you know, she's the good sister and Martha's the one that's, you know, she's the one that's OCD and she's the one that's, you know, trying to make sure it's all perfect. But, but can we all at least appreciate the Martha in this story? Because here's what we do know. This is Martha's home, not Mary. We don't even know if Mary has a house or Mary's her roommate, but Martha is so responsible that she has a house. 
And Martha cares about Jesus enough that when she's hosting him in her house, that she's gonna make sure he's not hungry. And she's gonna prepare the meal. And so she's got all of the details. I don't know if you got any detail people out there. The people who always think about, no, 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 it's gotta be right, it's gotta be clean, the meal's gotta be good. It's got, she's, this is Martha, and if there's anything I can really respect about Martha, is that Martha's the one making the food. Like, I love that about Martha, okay? So let's not, let's not be hard on Martha. And we don't know a whole lot about these two sisters, but we see in this moment the way Martha approaches it and how Mary does. Let me just say this, though. Can you imagine what it'd be like to have Jesus in your home? The miracle worker, the son of God, the one who's done all the things that he had done. Could you imagine what it'd be like to have him in your house? I mean, I feel like I'd be torn between Martha and Mary, wouldn't you? Like, I wanna make sure that it's perfect. I wanna, I wanna serve him something great, I'm gonna do this. But I also don't wanna miss this moment. And I want you to know how they both approach the same moment of time, but differently. Here, here's what Jesus says back in verse 41. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about what? Would you all say that word out loud? About many things. But, look at verse 42, but few things are what? Needed. Or indeed only one. And Mary has chosen what is what? What is better and it will not be taken away from her. Jesus points out, I think, the dilemma that we all have to deal with in life. The challenge of being distracted by many things versus focusing on what's needed. This, this is real, right? I, I don't know about you, but a lot of times I feel like Martha because I feel like I'm, I'm worrying all the time about things. That, that I'm thinking about the many things that I have to do. And most of us, we operate in multiple different roles, right? I'm a spouse, I'm a parent, I'm a pastor, I'm an, a leader, I'm an employer. I'm a, like, m most of us, we, we have multiple roles. And so, to fulfill them, we're often worried about all the things. Let's be honest, and I'll just own this, I worry about a lot of things, don't you? I mean, I, I'm, you worry, you worry about paying all the bills, you worry about your debt, you, you worry about you know, um, your kids, you worry about making sure that they have the right kind of food, you're worried about getting them to all their activities, you're worried about making sure there's a spiritual foundation for them, you're worried about your retirement, you're worried about making sure that you're saving enough money, you're worried that you're giving your kids the kind of life that you hope that they can have. You're, we're worried about things that we're worried about so much so that we have stress and anxiety. This is the American way, let's be honest. We keep filling our schedules, we keep adding more and more, and so many of us are living so worried about the many things that we want to accomplish and do in life. I understand that, I recognize that. But here's what I also see in this picture is that Mary and Martha all have the same amount of time and they have the same kind of moment, but Martha chooses to focus on all the things that she needs to do and Mary focuses on what is needed what is needed. What, what does this speak to you? You think about your life when Jesus says, but few things are needed. So most of us think, oh, I need all of it. I gotta get it all, I gotta do it all. And Jesus would speak and he said, no, no, few things are needed. And in fact, he said, Mary has chosen what is better. Everybody say better. Better. I want to choose a better way to live. Listen to me. You can fill your life with things that actually drain you. You can fill your cup with things that actually drain your soul. We have to be careful that we're choosing in life what is better. And listen to me. All of us have to make choices all day long. Because the world will pressure you to keep filling your life filling the buckets, and Jesus said, Mary chose what is better, and here's what I imagine a lot of us think when we think about all the things that we'd love to do and accomplish, and I hear you, Pastor, and I'm, I'm challenged, and I would love to serve, and I would love to start this, and I would love to be involved in this, and I would love to do this, and I just, I wanna do it all, 
but I don't have the time. You, you know what I found? We all have the exact same amount of time. We tend to make time for the things that matter. So we should stop saying when we think about the life that we hope to live, when we think about me and three, and go, man, I would love to have all this, but I don't have the time. You know what I found? We'll make time for what matters. The problem is, most of us, we don't realize that, is that we're adding things into our life that don't matter, and then we're saying, I don't have the time to do what really matters. And if we aren't careful and we don't choose what is better, we may end up with a lot of regret in life. We may end up like a guy named Solomon. I told you we're gonna get to Ecclesiastes. We're gonna go to Ecclesiastes 4 now because I want you to see the connection here. Solomon was a guy who pursued everything in search of an emptiness in his soul. He talks about it in Ecclesiastes. I'm chasing after everything. And he says, I denied myself no pleasure. I, I literally built an empire, but I was miserable. That's what Ecclesiastes, this little book in the Old Testament, is all about. In Ecclesiastes chapter four, in verse four, I want you to, I want you to notice something that, that Solomon says. This is wisdom. This is wisdom of somebody who lived a certain way and ended up regretting his life choices. In verse four, here's what he said. He says, then I observed that most people are motivated to success. Why are we running after everything and achieving? Why are we filling our schedules? Notice what he says, because they envy their neighbors. We're all trying to get something in life, and he says the motivation is actually we envy our neighbors. He says, but this too is meaningless. It's like chasing the wind. What does, he know, what does he recognize? He found out this, the motivating factor for success in filling my life and my schedule and everything I'm trying to build and earn is actually a deeper emotional need. What, what I'm trying to do with my life and how I'm staying so busy, the truth is what I discovered is that there's an internal emotional need where I'm trying to get what everybody else has. I'm trying to live the way everybody else lives. Because I want what my neighbor has. I want what they have. I want the life they have. I want the opportunities that they have. And so this is why I said why, why we're filling our schedules because we have an empty soul. We're trying to satisfy something internal. And so Solomon then, in the next two verses, he paints two extremes that we tend to fall into. These are the two extremes. Look at it. Verse five. Fools fold their idle hands, leading them to ruin, and yet, better to have one handful with quietness than two handfuls with hard work and chasing the wind. Here, here's the two extremes that he mentions, right? There's busyness and there's laziness. These are the two extremes. Here's what he said, the lazy person, they just fold their idle hands. What's a lazy person do? They don't work hard. They don't actually create anything. They want everything given to them. They wanna just you know, live off of everybody else's. They, they don't actually go after something. They don't actually work. They don't create something. He, he says this is one extreme, and we see this today in our culture that there's a lot of people that aren't actually motivated to create a life. Like God just, they think everything should be handed to them. I mean, shouldn't, just, shouldn't the government just give me a salary for breathing? I mean, wouldn't that be great? This, this is, right? He says that's one extreme, and the Bible talks a lot about laziness. It says their life will actually lead to ruin. You'll never experience the life that you hope to live and that God created you to live. So that's one, that's one extreme. What's the other extreme? The other extreme is burning the candle at both ends. The other extreme is the one that probably most of us probably tend to lean toward, which is overworking ourselves, overscheduling our lives. We're putting everything in, we're doing too much, we're gonna fill our schedules because our soul is empty. And here's what Solomon said, when you got both hands at it and you're just grasping for everything, you don't realize, but you're actually, it's meaningless, you're chasing after the wind. What did he say was better? He said, you know what's better? He said, one hand with quietness, right? Here's the picture, right? No hands, it's lazy. Both hands? It's busy, 
One hand, that's better. What does he mean by one hand? He's saying that rather than running after everything and using all your time and energy, everything you got to get everything you can, it's better to have a little bit, one handful, with quietness. It's better to have a little less, but to have a little more peace. It's better to not be working 80 hours a week because you're trying to impress people and you're trying to earn a certain salary and you're trying to look important and you're trying to impress your kids. And you're it's better to maybe work 40 hours a week and have a little bit of peace, a little bit of space in your life for your spiritual life, for your emotional health. It's better with this. And here's what I found. Our culture is continually pressuring us to live in these extremes. Live in these extremes. One or the other. Mostly in America, it's the one extreme of both hands running after it all. Can I just tell you what is supposed to live in the extremes? What is actually supposed to live in the extremes is margin. Isn't that what's in the edges? You all know what margin is, right? My Bible, my new Bible that I got this year, by the way, I got this new Bible, and unfortunately, we had to sacrifice a goat for it, but it's, it's a new Bible. <laughs> but for the word of God, it's okay. If you're a Peter friend, I'm sorry. Um, this space, right, around the text, I don't know if you can see that, the space around it, what's that called? It's called the, it's empty. But it's there for a purpose. There, there's space around it, and without it, this would look like chaos. In fact, can I tell you, I love the margin in my Bible, because I, that's where I get to put what God speaks to me in the margin. Can I tell you, you need margin in your life, because that's where God speaks to you. And when you have no margin, guess what? It's hard to hear the voice of God. We need margin in our lives if we're gonna create the life that we hope to create. What is margin? I got this definition from another pastor. I heard a series a long, long time ago and I always loved it, but I think it's beautiful. Margin is the amount available after what is needed. The amount available after what is needed. Remember what Jesus said. We're, Martha, you're running after many things, but few things are needed. We, we have to change our mindset if we wanna live a life filled with peace and a life where we step into all that God has for us, and we need margin. What is margin? Real simple. Margin is money left in your account after you paid all the bills. That's margin, right? Margin is time or energy left over for your spouse after you put the kids to bed. So you're not so exhausted, you don't even talk, you just go to bed. Margin is the space around your life and what's needed. I, my job is needed, taking care of my kids is needed, making sure the fed is needed, my spiritual life needed. Margin is the space around it for you to breathe, for your soul to live. How do we create space so we can create the life we want? Here's what I wanna do. In the remaining 10 minutes, I wanna give you three things that will help you create margin in your life. These are insanely practical, but they're hard to do. Okay, I wanna give you three things that I believe that if you will really honestly consider these things when it comes to your life and your schedule, that it can help you create some margin to have the life that you want. The first one is this, narrow your focus. Remember, remember what Jesus said, hey, you're thinking about all, too many things, Martha. Narrow your focus. And I believe that one of the biggest reasons why we go nowhere is because we're trying to go everywhere, right? One of the reasons why we don't accomplish very much is because we're actually trying to do too much. That's why we're not getting it done. There's a power in understanding sometimes that less is more. And here's the way I can describe it. Either you can be a light bulb or you can be a laser, but it's the same wattage. You can take a 100 watt light bulb, put it in a room, and it will create light for a room, but here's what we all know about a light is that it diffuses because it goes in all directions. 
You know what you can do with a 100 watt laser? And when you, when you point that into such a pinhole size, it has enough power to cut through things. So here's what I found in, in my life, and this is, I think, a really important thing for us to understand, is that in different seasons of life, you have to narrow your focus. This will be so incredibly helpful for some of you, okay? Because I know you've been sitting through these weeks, and you're like, all right, pastor, I'm supposed to... I'm supposed to do all these things and move toward the life I'm supposed to have and what God's called me to do on top of my job and my kids and my family. Okay, here's what I want. I want to, give, I want to bring some freedom to you. In every season of life, and they do change, narrow, pick a focus. This, this will bring freedom to some of you because you've been thinking right now, oh, I'm going to start a business. I'm going to write a book. I'm going to begin a podcast I'm gonna uh, get promoted, I'm gonna do, and, and I'm just saying, whoa, 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 slow down. No, you're not, you're gonna kill yourself. You're gonna end up divorced and your kids are gonna hate you. Don't do that, don't do that. Ask this question, what season am I in and what is the most important thing to do in this season? Like, Zach and I were having a, a great conversation this past week about it, and I was talking to him and we were talking about Man, it's so different, different seasons, all the things. Remember we were talking about all the things we want to do? And he says, I got four kids. What are they, under, under, they're seven and under. Four kids, seven and under. Dear Lord, let's just extend our hands toward him and just <laughs> lift him up and pray that God would bless him and keep him alive. And I don't know what causes, well, I know what causes, I don't know why, you, never mind, I, okay. And, and he was like, it's so much taking care of four kids and work in a house and feeding them and getting them to bed. That's all we pretty much have time for. Okay. So here's what you recognize when you have young kids and you're in that stage of life that we need to narrow our focus for this season. It may not be for your whole life, but for this season. So you know what might matter? Over these next three years, the most important thing that we could do is build a strong spiritual and emotional foundation for our children. Focus on things like that. Don't also, I'm gonna start a business. Also, I'm gonna write a book. Also, I'm gonna begin a podcast. Also, I'm gonna start a new venture. Also, I'm, no, 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 no. There, there's different times for different seasons. I love what Ecclesiastes 3 says, that there's a season for every different activity under the sun. We have to understand the power of that. So here's what I'm saying. If some of you, this is the sad reality. As I'm talking about this, you're going, oh shoot, I already wrote my letter. You're gonna have to rip it up and go get another one from Next Steps and start over. That's okay, we've got plenty of paper. If you wrote a list of all the things you're gonna do over the next three years that a really um, a high achiever couldn't accomplish in 30 years, you need to start over. You need to say, what am I gonna do in this season of life? If you're 19 years old and you're in college, maybe the most important thing for you to do in this season besides school, right, what's needed? All right now I'm in school, I've gotta live, what's needed my, is develop some really important habits and disciplines that will benefit you in life. So you're gonna focus on, I'm gonna try to exercise while I'm in school. I know I've got to do stuff for school. I'm just going to focus on reading. And oh, by the way, I'm going to have good nighttime habits, which means I'm not staying up till three o'clock every single morning playing video games because that's not good for me and it won't lead me to the life that I want. Do you understand what I'm saying? Does it make sense? I, I, want, to, I, want, to, I want to be real clear on this because I, I imagine you've been inspired to go, I'm going to do all this stuff. Let's not forget our rule. We overestimate what we do in the short term. Some people would say three years is short term. Some of you, the things you wanna do are 10 year plan, 15 year, 20 year, allow that, allow that. In this season, I'm gonna narrow my focus. Second thing I wanna encourage you to do, real practical, right? Choose what matters. Here's the beautiful thing. You have the power to choose what you do with your time. We all have the same amount of time. But maybe you just need reminded that you have the power to choose what you do with your time. And what you choose to do with your time will determine where you end up in three years. So here's what I'm saying. Make sure to choose what matters. Here's what that, that really looks like. That means you have to learn to say no. You have to learn to say no. You can't, like Solomon did, 
Chase after everything with both hands. It's meaningless, it's chasing after the wind. You won't actually grasp it and you won't be happier. Instead, with one hand, choose what is better. Right, what, what, did, what did Mary do? Mary chose what was better. That moment with Jesus, it was either fill your stomach or it was fill your spirit. Mary chose what was better in that moment. And so here's what we have to do. We have to learn how to choose what matters. Can I give you a real simple question that you can ask yourself, okay? There's a real simple question to ask yourself about your schedule, your calendar, you're filled, you're overwhelmed. Maybe what you need to do is an exercise, you, you, your spouse, whatever, is you go down and you look at everything that you're doing and you ask this question, does this matter in 30 years? Does this thing that we're doing matter in 30 years? Does it? Well, my job, does it matter in 30 years? Yep, it might. I, I need to provide for our family, it's gonna provide for our future. Yep, it matters. However, you might wanna think about your job because if your jo job demands 80 hours, then what you're doing is you're exchanging a significant portion of your life for that paycheck. You have to really ask, is it worth it, okay? So, so you're gonna say, does this matter in 30 years? Working out, does this matter in 30 years? Would you say yes or no? Yeah, I would. Because listen, if you don't take care of your health now, you'll pay for it later. My doctor says it all the time. I, tell, I said to the doctor, I said, it costs a lot of money to eat healthy. It does, doesn't it? It's way cheaper to eat bad. It really is. But you know what they'll tell you? You either pay for it now or you pay for it later in medicine and medical problems. So, so you're choosing what matters. Working out, yep, that's, that's gonna be important to do, right? Think about your family life and your schedule, okay? Uh, even leisure activities, playing golf, will it matter in 30 years? Well, I kinda wanna at least be a 10 handicap by the time I retire, so I guess maybe it does. I'm not saying don't play golf. I'm saying if you're overwhelmed and you're too busy, you need to cut out the things that don't really matter, okay, if you wanna create the life you want. Playing video games, will this matter in 30 years? It doesn't matter in 30 minutes. <laughs> it's fun, but you could be doing some other things with your life, just saying, right? Um, think about it, go through your schedule. Here's one a lot of you are not gonna wanna hear, so I'm gonna say it anyways. Your kids, and their activities. Because your kid is playing baseball and football and running track, and they're awesome. And I imagine they're gonna go pro. <laughs> Amen, I, I'm, I'm proud of your kid too. Uh, the reality is that 99.9% of them won't. Now here's the thing, I, I know this tension, and this, can I just say, is a very real tension. I know this tension because I raised two daughters that both played a sport or participated. But what we had to do as a family is we had to find where there's balance. So our rule, that's just ours, do whatever you want, was you can play one activity, one sport at a time. If you wanna try something else, that's fine, it was ours. Because we valued their investment in family time, we valued them experiencing a regular rhythm of knowing Christ here and being part of the church community. And there were, there were, there were you know, tournaments and things here and there. But for the most part, you can ask our kids, we prioritize showing up for church and having spiritual depth to our family. Guess what? They're both out of school. None of them do their sports or their activities. Both of them are heavily invested in this church community. I value that. Ask, does this matter in 30 years as you go through? And it doesn't mean that you can't do it. It might mean in that season, I'm gonna say no because I find something else more important. Here's the last one, the last one is short. Prioritize being over doing. Prioritize being over doing. Some of you maybe put down your letter and it was just a, a list of all the things that you wanna accomplish over the next three years. I wanna get my master's degree and I wanna start this and I wanna read 50 books and I wanna do this and I wanna do that and I want, listen, I'm all about that. I'm, I'm like wired that way too. And so this is kinda of hard for me but I, one of the things I have learned as I've gotten a little bit older 
Because even after I read 50 books, it doesn't necessarily mean that it changes who I am. I might be a lot smarter, but I might not, I might not look a little bit more like Jesus. And the question I think we have to ask ourselves in life is, what matters most? What matters most in this life? Because here's what I know. You were created as a human being. We often like to say, not a human doing. And most of us, I think, like Solomon, like Martha, we're spending our lives trying to accomplish a lot. And I think the question we should ask is why? Are we really trying to, to meet a need inside through all the activities that we do outside? And I guess the question I would ask you is, what is your goal in life? Because if your goal in life is to end up with the most amount of stuff, then you'll feel just like Solomon. This was meaningless, it was a chasing after the wind. Can I give you a better goal? I think a better goal is to become more like Jesus. I think that should be the highest goal, is that my life looks more and more like Jesus. You know, one of the things that I'll just tell you, and I, I don't think you have to share anything, it's on your letter, but one of the very first things that I put on my letter was something that I feel like God's just, it's been a work in progress. Because I tell you, I'm not that great at this, but I'm grind, trying to grow in this area. Is the very first thing I put on there is that I hope in three years that I can look back and say, I am, I am a more generous person. That I'm giving more, that I'm giving more of my money, my time, because I care more about who I'm becoming than what I'm accomplishing. And I'm telling you, like, what really matters at the end of this day is who you are. I've done a lot of funerals, and I can't, I can't even remember one of them where somebody got up, there was a loved one of the person who died, and just went on and on about all their accomplishments. Every time I've officiated a funeral, a family member, a friend, a loved one gets up there, and you know what they do? They talk about the impact that they made on them. They talk about the legacy that they left to their children. They talk about the kind of person that they were to be around. They talk about who they were, not what they did. So if, if we're gonna create margin, then here's what we gotta do. We're gonna narrow our focus, we're gonna choose what matters, and we're gonna prioritize being over doing. And I believe if we do that, in three years from now, we're gonna look back and we're gonna go, I don't, maybe I didn't accomplish all the goals that I had, but I am kinder, I'm more loving, I'm a better dad, I'm a better spouse, I'm a better friend, I'm a better follower of Jesus, I care more about his mission and the church than I ever have, I'm giving more than I ever have. Listen, that's what I would rather see at the end of my three years, how about you? That's what I wanna see, amen? Come on, why don't you stand up with me? As we close out this series, and maybe some of you, listen, if some of you after today go, I think I wanna rewrite my letter, go get a new one. Go get a new one. But I, I think there's a power to giving us a self-addressed letter that we're gonna send to you in three years. But I hope it doesn't just have all the things you wanna do, I hope it really also defines who you're being, who you're becoming, because it is really powerful when we do that. Would you bow your heads for a moment? Let's just, can we have a moment of connecting with our creator? Do you know he's the one that created you and made you, and he knows exactly what he made you for and the life he wants for you to experience? Father God, I thank you for your presence here. God, I thank you for the power of your word. God, help me to be like Mary this year and over these three years, to not even let moments like this go by without reflecting on what it looks like to sit at your feet, to make space for rest in your presence, to, to make room, God, for you to minister. Can I just tell you there's a power when you don't try to do all these things in your own, can I just tell you, on my own strength, I can't accomplish the things that I have that I feel like God's called me to do. God's created it that way so that you will rest in him. 
when you feel overwhelmed, when you feel like I can't do all this, that's when Jesus would speak to you and he would say, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. My grace is sufficient for you. Can you just allow his spirit, his grace to meet you in this moment? I don't know what you have for the next three years that you're dreaming and thinking about, but can I just tell you that when you try to do it on your own strength and power, that most of the time we will fail, but here's the beautiful thing. When we trust in God, when we lean into God, when we rest in a miracle working God, when we prioritize the presence of God in a Sabbath, when we prioritize being in his presence, that's when God begins to do things in us that will translate to who he's creating us to become. Come on, maybe in this moment, let's just create a moment of worship where, where we can invite the miracle working God into our lives. Where we say, God, we can't do this on our own, but we need your help. God, we believe that you can help us, that there's a power that comes. Thanks so much for tuning in to this message. I hope that it encouraged you and inspired your faith. If God is doing something in your life, would you take a moment and let us know? We wanna connect with you and we wanna be able to pray for you. All you have to do is shoot us an email to hello at the x.church or you can always send us a DM on one of our social media platforms. And if you know somebody that would also be encouraged by this very message, why not take a moment and just share it with them right now? And as always, I want to say thank you to every single person who so generously financially supports this ministry so we can continue to get messages like these out to people all over the world. We believe God is building something special and you're a significant part of it. Until next time, have a great day.